Before I begin, even with prayer, I, I, I want to just say that it is truly a privilege that you would consider this Mexican kid from down the street to share here with you. I'm actually uh, born and raised in Mexico, but Riverside has been my home since 1995, since we hopped over that little fence. No, we drove through, but we're still here. To the pastors of this uh, wonderful congregation that, by the way, we're all learning from and growing with, uh, I thank you for the honor and the privilege to share in this moment. And um, but Pastor Alfonso Green, who I haven't had a chance to meet in person, I thank you for entrusting me behind this sacred space today. And I hope and pray that when it's all said and done, as we leave this place, we can leave with the confidence that we have been in the presence of a holy God. Let's pray together. The one who breaks curses, the one who never loses battles. You deserve all the honor and all the glory and all the praise. Lord, we're not here by coincidence today, and I've been praying and listening over the last couple weeks waiting for this moment, and as I'm listening to the theology of these songs, I can see that you have been orchestrating something leading up to this moment. And I just pray, Lord, that as we sit here and expect something from the throne of grace, that we may receive it tenfold, that whatever we came here expecting, may be small in comparison to what we receive. We want to see your face, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I've seen the face of God. And I'm not saying this presumptuously. I've just seen the face of God. I, I've seen the face of God. I, I, I've, I've seen the face of God. I've seen the face of God. And I'm not talking about, you know, in Matthew 25 where Jesus says, whenever you see the least of these, you, you did it to me. No, I'm not, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the face of God. I've seen the face of God. Over the last year and a half, I've been right there in the face of God. I've been experiencing the face of God. As soon as pandemic hit and everything that came with it that placed me in front, in close proximity of the face of God. Have you seen the face of God? No, no, I'm serious, Ruby. Have you seen the face of God? Have you identified the face of God? See, a lot of times we think of heaven and we imagine all the things that we will see. And we imagine, right, the chubby babies on clouds and the, the, you know, the, 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 gold, the streets of gold and the lion and the lamb. But we all expect to see something when we get to heaven, and it's the face of God. But do you realize that we get a preview on this side of glory? You can see the face of God. As a matter of fact, I'm, I want to argue that you have seen the face of God. I've seen the face of God. I've seen the face of God. I'm going to Genesis chapter 32 today, and I want you to navigate this with me. Genesis chapter 32 is one of those stories that oftentimes we really don't know what to do with it. But I hope and pray that as we navigate through this, that the Holy Spirit may lead us to understanding that we may truly understand what's been going on over the last couple of years. Genesis chapter 32, 
verse 22. I, I want to just give you a brief moment to open your Bible. I want, us, I want you to read along with me. I'm going to read the first uh, few verses, and then we're going to break down some ideas moving forward. Genesis 32 says the following in verse 22. The same night, he arose and took his two wives and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the break of day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? He said, my name is it's Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. Matt Rubito, have you seen the face of God? I, I've been to the face of God. I've, I've seen the face of God. As a matter of fact, the last couple years for me, I've spent it in the face of God. Today we look at this brother by the name of Jacob. Jacob, let, let me just kind of give you a survey, a Wikipedia survey on Jacob. His name means some planter, someone who steals someone else's place. And we know Jacob has a track record. He was a hustler. He hustled his brother Esau out of his birthright. He was a deceiver. He deceived his daddy Isaac for his blessing. He also lied about who Rachel was. He said, that's my sister, when in reality, she was a little bit more than that. You see, 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 he was a dishonest guy. He was inauthentic. He was a trickster. He was a supplanter. Jacob made honor to his name. That's who he was. But you see, in order for us to understand what's going on in Genesis 32, we need to frame it with what's happening in Genesis 28. Are you all Bible students, by the way? Let's go to the Bible. Let's go to Genesis 28 to see what sets us up to what's about to happen in, verse, in, in chapter 32. Genesis 28, the same guy, the same Jacob, is now having a transformative experience. He's walking in the middle of a field in the middle of the night when all of a sudden he has this dream. And in this dream, Jacob sees this ladder that connects humanity to divinity, earth to heaven, heaven to earth. And there's angels going up and angels coming down, angels going up, angels coming down. And on top of the ladder, the Lord. Genesis 28 verses 13 and on says, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you, Jacob, and to your offspring, your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and the north and to the south. And in you, Jacob, and you, hustler, and you, deceiver, and you, trickster, all the earth will be blessed. Behold, I am with you, Jacob. And will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. And here is the line for today. For I will not leave you until. I will not leave you. What's the word? Until. 
I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So he was a hustler. He was a deceiver. He was a liar. He was inauthentic. He was, he was a thief. He was a robber. He was dishonest, but he had a promise. Jacob had a promise. This reminds me that I can be a whole mess and still have a promise. This reminds me that I don't have to have it all together. I can still have a promise. This lets me know that sometimes I may take a really bad spill, but my spill does not cancel the promise of God over my life. He was all that. <laughs> he, he had a track record. He had baggage and baggage and baggage. He was a whole mess, but still he was a man with a promise. Let's go back to ver- uh, chapter 32 for a moment. Because so, so, something significant is about to happen here. Something significant. The Bible says that he is walking around. He has already left his family. He's left them across the brook. He's walking around. And all of a sudden, suddenly, suddenly, in the middle of the night, suddenly, suddenly, he is attacked by a man. Don't you find it fascinating that our greatest struggles happen in the middle of the night? It doesn't happen. They don't happen when it's nice and bright. They don't happen when everything's happening. No, no, when everything seems to be out of control, that's when the biggest problems come in on top of already a circumstance that is out of control. Yo, that was 2020 for so many of us. We don't just have to deal with pandemics. No, there is chaos upon chaos upon chaos and depression and anxiety and I lost the job and I lost my my, my, my fiance and I lost my kid. There's, There's so much chaos upon chaos upon chaos. And here's what kills me. It comes without warning. Yo, how many of us had that, you know, hashtag vision 2020, you know, happening? Yo, this was going to be our year, 2020, the new millennium. And all of a sudden, everything went to. And it happened suddenly. Suddenly. In the middle of the night. It happened suddenly. It happened suddenly in the middle of the night. Things happen in the middle of the night. And they happen suddenly. But I want you to catch this, man, Rubido. I want you to catch this because verse 27, 28 tells me that something good can come out of what happens in the middle of the night. Verse 27 says the following. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, my name is Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. You missed that. The middle of the night is when we experience our biggest change. It's where we experience our biggest transformation. It's in the middle of struggle. It's when things are not easy. That's when we shift and transform and change and bloom the most. Anyone can do easy. Anyone can do easy. Anyone can do a good season, a steady season, a predictable season. Anyone can do easy. But let me tell you something. No one changes during easy. And I know some, some of us are professional churchgoers. And we think that by binging 17 sermons each Sabbath, we are going to experience a transformation that our character ought to be having. We think that by, 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 by tuning online to this service and then hopping over to this one and then this one and then this, we think that's, that's character for me. Let me tell you something. A sermon may change your perspective, but a struggle will change your life. happened in the middle of the night it happened as he was struggling it happened when he least expecting it and i want you to see what happens because up until this point he's been a hustler he's been a deceiver he's been a liar but when he faces the angel in the middle of the night and the angel asks him what is your name he says my name is jacob 
See, before he would have said Esau. But something happens about the heart of struggle that makes your mask useless. What good is pretending when you have cancer? What, what, what good is your mask when you're going through depression? Like, come on, come on. When, when you're facing suicidality fa- head on, when you're experiencing with despair, what good is your mask? He was right there in the middle of the night. He was in the middle of the night. He took off his mask and he said, my name is I'm Jacob. He took it off. Familia, your mask is no good in the middle of the night. And as church folk, we are good with masks. We're not very good with these. <laughs> I see some put them on like, suddenly. I didn't mean to throw stones. You, you, you know the mask I'm talking about. You, know, you lift your, your arms a little higher when you're experiencing shame, and you sing a little louder when you, when you need a favor from God, and, and you may be going through hell and back, excuse me, but when people ask you, how's it going? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. We, we're good with masks. We're good with masks. We, we know masks. We invented masks. What good is your mask in the middle of a storm? Could it be that the best thing we could do in the middle of the night yeah. I'm Jacob. Show yourself for who you are and where you are in the middle of the night. Because that's where God wants to, wants, to, wants to execute your greatest transformation. It's in the middle of the night, but we have to keep it real in the middle of the night. So, so here's, here's where I love this story. I'm not, I'm not going to keep you very, very long. Uh, this, is, this is a thing that has arrested me time and time again whenever I read this. And I never really, really understood what it meant because theologically, it, it leaves me doubting. It leaves me uncomfortable when I read it uh, just, just off the page, you know, without any further analysis. It bothers me what happens in the story. I'm going to read actually four verses, verse, verse 24 and on. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for this day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, my name is Jacob. And then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. And here it is. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. So your your identity has changed. There's been actual transformation in who you are because you have struggled with with God and with humans and have prevailed. It doesn't say one. It doesn't say you struggled with God and won. How do you win against God? He's never lost a... You all just saying it. You see, oftentimes growing up, oh, el luchó contra Dios y le ganó, right? He struggled against God and beat him. How do you defeat God? Familia, could it be that the victory in Jacob's life was not defeating God, but prevailing and enduring in the battle? 
You can't defeat God. You can't be, you can't tap him out. You can't knock him out. No, no, no. You see, the word prevail actually means endure. And Jacob, Jacob went on this battle with the Lord, a battle that was so hard and so violent that it actually injured him for the rest of his life. And yet this is how he won. He clung to God. He stuck with it. He did not let go. He did not give up. He believed in the words we just sang. He's never lost the battle, right? He believed that God was faithful to his promises. And Jacob lasted. Therefore, he received the victory. Sometimes the victory is simply to last. One more day. I can't stand my co-worker, but I'm, it's one more day. <laughs> my kids are driving me insane. And I can't even fathom parenting for a week. One more day. <sighs> Another week of ministry? One more day. I got to get up and sing again. No, 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 no. One more day. I got to go to work on Monday. One more day. You mean, Lord, that I have to stand in front of a camera in an office for another sermon? I didn't sign up for this, Lord. I signed up to be around people. This pandemic locked me in an office. One more day. The way we get victory is by holding on one more day. The way we get victory is by simply showing up. So let me tell you something. This may have been a struggle this morning. You woke up, your Roma wasn't where it was supposed to be. You know, you didn't, you, you didn't, you didn't feel coming to church. You weren't expecting much, but yet you're here. God somehow peeled you out of that comfy bed and brought you here. Let me remind you something. If you're here, if you're holding on today, this is the victory that God had for you it's one more day it's one day at a time it's i'm going to keep on showing up i'm going to keep parenting i'm going to keep serving i'm going to keep pastoring i'm going to keep working i'm going to keep ministering one day at a time the one who, who who remains is the one who has the victory i, I was talking to one of my church members a couple weeks ago Pastors, what do you do? Help me. When a mother and a father have been praying for their kid who have cerebral palsy, he can't walk. He can't speak. They believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. They believe in the power of Jesus. They believe prayer works. They believe, they believe it, they believe it. And we've anointed and we've interceded and we've done prayer circles and he still can't walk and he still can't speak. She, she, she called me a couple days ago, a couple weeks ago. She said, Pastor Manny, we need a small group for people with unanswered prayers. People with unanswered prayers. We had three, three sessions filled with people with unanswered prayers. She wrote me a text message explaining to me her rationale behind the need of this group. And watch what she said. God had al has allowed such deep pain in my life. So many unanswered prayers. There's a huge population in our church that cannot relate to a prosperity gospel. To the idea that God can and he will because the truth is that it hasn't been the case in their lives. It is such a difficult journey, she says. To remain faithful even when God has not performed the miracle we hoped he would. But, but, but this is what shattered me. But many of us choose him anyway. 
Jackson. She stained. She stained. She stained. She could have walked away, but she stained. She could have walked away, but she stained. She's pulling through one more day. She is parenting one more day. She is trusting one more day. She is surrendering one more day. She's doing it one more day. I could tell Nella straight to face, Nella, you are victorious because you have endured. One more day, one more day, one more day, one more day, one more day. Oftentimes we, we see the year ahead. We see five years ahead and it's overwhelming. Can you do one more day? Familia, can you do one more day? That's what Jesus is asking for. Can you do one more day? It's not about winning. It's not about defeating. It's about clinging one more day. One day at a time. One Sabbath at a time. One week at a time. Let's take this thing one more day. One more day. One more day. Now, now here's, here's the meat of this story. Here, here's what theologically just blows my mind. When, when I read this, I often read this as a fragmented story apart from the entire Genesis narrative, apart from the entire story of Jacob. But we have to understand that what God is doing here, he's building a picture. He's building a story. We don't just show up in chapter 32 and consider it as an isolated event. No, God has been up to something in the life of Jacob. Why? Was he able to prevail? What, what, what gave him the ability to prevail? What gave him the tools? What gave him the strength? What gave him the hope to stick around, to take it one more day? What was the thing that helped him prevail? Here it is, simple. He had a promise. You didn't hear me. You, you didn't hear me. He had a promise. Because in chapter 28, God told him, I will not leave you, and I gave you a word. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. I will not leave you. What is the word? Uh, I want to hear you say, I will not leave you. One more time. I will not leave you. So Jacob was like, okay, I will not let you go. You see, you see he, he was a hustler, but he had a promise. He was a deceiver, but he had a promise. He was a liar and dishonest, but he had a promise. This brother was a mess, but he had a promise. He, he struggled in the dark, but he had a promise. He, he experienced fear, and he was alone, but he had a promise. Familia, I, I like to keep it real from the pulpit. May I? This last song wrecked me. Wrecked me. Thank you, thank you for the Kleenex. It wrecked me. Let me tell you why. I've had the worst year and a half of my life. This minister of the gospel, ordained by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, depression, anxiety, suicidality. You know how hard it is to love Christ's church and to be stripped away from it. And now you're confined to preaching to an iPhone, <laughs> to texting people rather than being in their presence. Do you know how hard it is to live an isolated life as a pastor, on regular, like on, in normal seasons? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Now imagine how much more in a pandemic. Mm. I hit rock bottom. I have, now don't tell my conference president this, I have my letter of resignation in my draft box. I've wanted to quit time and time and time and time again, I've wanted to quit everything. T 
time and time and time again. This year and a half has been dark. It's been scary. It's been lonely. I've wanted to quit time and time and time again, but I have a promise. That's what leaves me. That's what keeps me holding on. The fact that years ago, God had a a, a moment where he showed me a ladder and angels were coming up and angels were coming down and angels were going up and angels were coming down. And in that promise, God told me, I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. That keeps me holding on. I will not let you go until you bless me. Suicidality, depression, anxiety, loneliness, whatever it may be, I have a promise. Familia, what we've gone through as a world, as a human race, is enough to make anyone want to quit. What we've gone through as churches and congregations and, and families, it's enough to make anyone want to quit. I'm just here. This, this, this Mexican kid from down the street is just here to bring you encouragement. Hold on, Mount Rubido. You have a promise. You have a promise. You have a promise. I, I'm out of your way. I'm, I'm, I'm landing this here. I, 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 want you, I want you to see now the, the language that the, the text uses, the language. I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a text guy. I, I'm not giving illustrations. I like, I like just digging into the text. I like looking and exegeting the text. Notice the language that is used here in verse 26. Then he said, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. I will not let you go until you bless me. Don't, don't, don't rush pa- past that. Don't, don't, don't don't, don't, don't skip the significance of what Jacob is requesting here. Don't just breeze through it. I know you learned it in Sabbath school. Some of you all have PhDs in Sabbath school by now. You know these stories. Don't, don't just rush through it. Notice what Jacob is saying. I will not let you go until you bless me. Until you bless me. Until you bless me. One of my favorite homileticians says that when Jacob is asking for a blessing, what he is asking for is for God to transfer him something. The blessing of God is a transfer. It's, it's God giving you something that you did not have before. It's God giving you and transferring something that is within God's self and placing it upon your life. I will not let you go until you transfer me something, until you give me something. I will not leave here until I have more than when I arrived. I will not leave here with, without more faith. I will not leave here without more strength. I will not leave here without more power. I will not leave here without more courage, more boldness, more wisdom, more maturity, more clarity. I will not let you go until you transfer me something that belongs to you. So when we find ourselves in the middle of the night, we ought to be expecting to leave that space with more wisdom. With more maturity, with more strength, with more courage, with more boldness. That is the blessing of God. He said, I will not let you go until you bless me, until you bless me, until you transfer me something that belongs to you. Here it is. What I find so fascinating about this is that when the story ends, look at verse 30. Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. You, You missed that. You missed that. Jacob says, I'm calling this place Peniel. Because I have seen God face to face. Let me, let me break something to you. He never saw his face. 
he never saw his face. So as I'm sitting there with this God, he never saw his face. That's when it hit me. The struggle is the face of God. See, this entire time you thought you were going through the struggle on your own. You didn't know you were right up in his face. This entire time you were wondering, where is God? You were literally in the face of God. So I can stand here with confidence today, not as a cocky little Mexican kid from down the street. I am standing here with confidence saying, I have been to the face of God. I've seen the face of God. And I want to submit that you have seen the face of God. And as we stand in the face of God, God's invitation for us is simply, do not let go until I bless you. Familia, I, 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 am, I, I, I am interceding for this congregation. I am interceding for your journey. I am interceding for, for all of us churches that are having to rebuild, having to restructure, having to reconnect people, re reassimilate people into our lives. And let me tell you something. As we hold on to Jesus, he will give us something that belongs to him. He will transfer us that power. He will tra transfer us that strength, that courage, that boldness. And we will have our Israel, Jacob, Jacob, Israel moment, the transformation that happens in the middle of the night. All you have to do is hold on one more day. One more day. Lord, we thank you. Because even in the middle of the night, even as struggles come in suddenly, we can have the confidence that we're right up in your face. We're in the face of God, Lord, and we don't have to defeat you. All you're asking for us is to hold on. You've made it a promise. You said, I will not leave you until we're responding. I will not let you go until you bless me. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Can we say his name together? Amen. Jesus, if Jesus. you believe in him, say his name. Jesus. Let's say his name one more time. Jesus. Jesus, we believe in you, so we say your name one more time. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, in your name we pray. Amen and amen.